coastal ocean. It's more than a place for recreation. It's food and energy. The ocean is one of our most important resources. But man is polluting its waters, threatening marine life. Coal is another important resource. Power plants that burn coal create thousands of tons of solid waste each day. As more plants turn to coal as an energy source, how can we dispose of this growing heap? The men and women aboard this vessel have been developing a method to dispose of coal waste in the ocean. A method that could benefit marine life. This is the story of their research. Okay, Thomas, are ready? Okay, okay. This is the story of how they learned to transform coal waste into a productive artificial reef. Energy. We use more than any other nation on Earth. Enormous amounts of oil are imported from an uncertain market. So America is again turning to coal. We've got plenty of it. Enough to last 200 years. But coal brings problems. Power plants that burn coal create a waste product called fly ash. While filters keep tons of fly ash from getting into the air, it must be put somewhere. Then there's the problem of sulfur oxide gases, gases that may be harmful to the environment and are produced by burning high sulfur coal. But a process called scrubbing helps solve this problem. Dick Coleman is the foreman at a Midwestern utility. This power plant is equipped with a scrubber so that it can burn high sulfur coal without polluting the air. At the scrubber, we use a limestone slurry to remove the sulfur oxide from the flue gases. This slurry is mixed with quick lime and fly ash and then hauled to a landfill. Thousands of tons of solid waste are produced by cleaning up the emissions at just one plant. What can be done with it? In rural areas, landfills can be safely used. But what about other parts of the country? Urban areas are having problems disposing of their traditional waste. Adding coal waste will make the problem worse. Bart Chesar is a research engineer for the New York State Power Authority. Electric utilities in the New York City area are presently considering converting from oil to coal. One of the problems in converting to coal is finding suitable locations for the disposal of the coal wastes. For this reason, we in New York are interested in the research being conducted at Stony Brook. The effects of dumping waste in the ocean have long been a major concern of scientists at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. In the early 1970s, our scientists indicated that we would have to find environmentally acceptable ways of disposing of coal waste in coastal areas. We felt this... Dr. Jerry Schubel is director of Stony Brook's Marine Sciences Research Center. Many of the most serious environmental problems that we have in the coastal ocean are truly interdisciplinary in character. And at the center, we, ha we have scientists in all of those disciplines represented. And our people are particularly good, I think, at working in groups to address these kinds of complex problems. Ivor Dudal is a chemist. Peter Woodhead is a marine biologist. Jeff Parker is an oceanographer. Together, they began to look for a safe, new way to dispose of coal waste in the sea. 
The oceans have a large, almost infinite capacity to receive waste. The problem is to understand the fate of this material, how it reacts in seawater, and where it eventually goes. Each waste will behave differently. Sewage waste will decompose rapidly. Uh, dredge material waste will lie on the bottom for a long period of time. Radioactive waste will decay only by radioactive processes. It had already been suggested that loose coal ash and some of the scrubber sludge materials would not behave properly in the ocean. In other words, there'd be environmental or detrimental effects. At about the same time, we learned that the ash itself could be stabilized with the use of chemicals and made in the form of blocks. Our idea was to use this material in the sea as substrate for artificial reefs. Hence the start of the research that led to the Sea Warp program. Sea Warp, the coal waste artificial reef project. Let's go. A reef is essentially a, a rocky outcrop of the seabed. Typically we think of coral reefs, but uh, here in the north we have rocky granites, slates, any of these things will form reefy outcrops. The Coal Waste Artificial Reef Project uh, was unique in that we were going to establish our own reef, so to speak, on a relatively empty seabed. We would create a, a new niche with new materials on which a wide variety of animals can get a foothold and grow. The Stony Brook idea, use coal waste to build an artificial reef. First step, make blocks that would survive in the sea. Fly ash and scrubber sludge can be combined with an additive, lime, to form the solid blocks. Our first experiments were with solid proctor size materials. These blocks were first tested in the laboratory for their physical and chemical properties. Engineers at Stony Brook's material science department used compression tests to measure the strength of the blocks. They determined that the blocks would resist erosion in the sea. Experiments were run in the chemistry lab to see whether elements dangerous to sea life would leach from the blocks. Test blocks were suspended in seawater. Tank samples were analyzed on the atomic absorption spectrophotometer. This instrument can measure extremely small concentrations of chemical elements. Virtually no harmful substances were found in the tank samples. Before we put the coal waste blocks in the sea, we tested them fairly extensively for potential toxicity. Uh, these bioassays were worst case assays in which we ground the material to a fine powder, shook it in seawater for about 48 hours to make soluble any toxic components, and then tested this against animals. The results of the tests on a wide variety of sensitive animals and plants were all negative. We found uh, no toxic effects. Conscience Bay is an arm of Long Island Sound. Here, the research moved into the field. After obtaining positive results in our laboratory tests, we came here to Conscience Bay to put our first test blocks in the water. We monitored these blocks for over two years while preparing for a larger reef in the Atlantic Ocean. We found no adverse environmental effects due to the presence of these blocks. The blocks have provided surfaces for the colonization and overgrowth of a diverse community of uh, seaweeds of invertebrates and fish have moved in and taken up habitation. Um, when we tested the organisms growing on the block surfaces for toxic elements, uh, we found no uptake whatsoever. In miniature, the reef made from coal waste worked. It was time to build a full-scale reef two miles south of the Fire Island Lighthouse in the Atlantic Ocean. We decided to build a reef of blocks made with about 500 tons of this coal waste material. This represents about a half a day's production from a typical coal-fired power plant. One important goal of the project was to show that we could mass produce this material into blocks in an assembly line process. That was a job for a manufacturer experienced in making concrete building blocks and with the machines to do it. Small amounts of additives were mixed with the coal waste. 42 tons of coal waste could be processed every hour. The block making machine turned out three reef blocks every five seconds.
These blocks were manufactured and cured in the same way that concrete building blocks are made. Only the ingredients were different. The 500 tons of coal waste became 15,000 reef blocks. At the docks in New Jersey, the blocks were loaded into a barge, getting the roughest treatment they would ever encounter. They had to be strong. September 1980. The blocks arrived at the reef site and were met by the research vessel and a boat filled with scientists, government officials, and local citizens. With the dumping of the blocks into the sea, the final test of the Stony Brook idea began. Now that the blocks were actually in the ocean, would marine life be drawn to them? Would they stand up to the erosion of tides and currents? The reef lies on a sandy ocean floor, 70 feet below the surface. Plankton and sediment suspended in the water makes for poor visibility. Working on the reef was difficult, but the research continued at the site and in the lab. We put the clean coal waste blocks in the sea, and within three or four weeks, we found uh, four species of different animals uh, growing on the blocks. We have quite a lot of barnacles here. Among the barnacles are small tube worms, as well as circular colonies of bryozoans. These plant-like growths are colonies of hydroids. Larger invertebrates, such as sea anemones, also attach themselves to the blocks. It was important to learn how rapidly invertebrates were colonizing the reef. In one method, divers took photographs of specially marked blocks. The photographs were taken at a fixed distance, so the same area was seen in each picture. In the laboratory, the photographs were examined under the microscope. The abundance of each species was estimated and compared to earlier photographs of the same block. In another method, test bricks from the reef were placed in a tank to prevent the animals from drying out. The number of each species was counted and recorded. Comparisons with earlier bricks indicate that colonization is occurring at a normal rate. All of the organisms colonizing the blocks are animals. They're all potential forage for fin fishes. Black sea bass, flounder, and other fish popular with anglers were soon living at the reef. Creating a habitat for these fish is a key reason for building an artificial reef. The presence of other fish, like this eel pout, indicates that the reef is supporting a wide variety of sea life. The species known as cunner was most important to the Stony Brook scientists. We're studying cunner in particular because they're by far the most abundant species. Uh, we're interested in the increase in the population, how the population changes with time. And we can use this to, to measure the degree of colonization of the reef. Two days after setting the fish traps, the scientists returned to study the catch. A total length, one Each fish was measured to determine its age. Tags were attached so that fish could be identified when recaptured later. A few fish were taken to the lab for more detailed examination. Most were returned directly to the reef. We found that the cunners uh, moved in quite a distinctive pattern. First of all, large males moved onto the reef. Uh, then these were followed by increasing numbers of females, so the sex ratio became normal once more. And then in the following summer, 
large numbers of juvenile fish were recruiting to the population. So that one year after placement of the reef, we had a pretty normal population in all respects. Stony Brook scientists weren't the only ones interested in catching fish at the reef. Charter fishing boats were soon a common sight to the crew of the research vessel. How long will the reef last to provide homes for the fish and food for the fishermen? Are the blocks strong enough to survive underwater? The project scientists devised ways to find the answers. The coal waste blocks uh, bear a lot of similarities to concrete materials. Herb Carlton is an engineering professor at Stony Brook's Materials Science Department. He used two methods to determine the strength of the reef blocks, ultrasonic and compressive testing. The compressive strength of a material is very useful. However, it's limited since the material has to be destroyed in the process. The ultrasonic measurements have the ability to evaluate the strength of the material and to do this without destroying the blocks. The ultrasonic apparatus sends sound waves through the block. By measuring the time it takes for the sound to pass through the block, the scientists are able to determine its strength. Ultrasonic testing is very important for us because we were able to develop instrumentation which we could use at the reef site. One part is controlled by the diver and can be brought to the reef itself. It's connected to an electronic unit on the research vessel. This made it possible to make measurements on the same blocks and the same material month after month. The results of compressive testing and ultrasonic analysis have shown us that the coal waste blocks retain their strengths over long periods of time in the ocean environment. To predict how long the reef blocks will remain strong, they were also tested for changes in chemical composition. Samples were prepared for analysis by the atomic absorption spectrophotometer. A major chemical component of the blocks is calcium. By determining the rate that a block is leaching calcium, it's possible to estimate its overall rate of deterioration. The results of the chemical and physical tests indicate that the reef blocks should last several decades in the ocean. People should still be catching fish and diving for lobsters on this reef well into the next century. Sea Warp, a five-year effort to help solve a complex problem, the disposal of coal waste in coastal areas. Coal can be burned without polluting the air, and the waste product can be transformed into artificial reefs. Reefs that provide homes for fish and better catches for fishermen. The work of Stony Brook's marine scientists has demonstrated that a problem waste can be used to benefit the coastal ocean.